Okay, so now we go to estate and donors taxes. This is Title 3, Chapter 1. You notice this schedule here. This is an example again of a scheduler tax system. The less the amount is, the less tax you will pay. So for the net estate, if the net estate is not over 200,000, 200,000 or less, it's exempt from estate tax. I will just browse through the provisions and I will uh, discuss the, which I think the more important provisions. So I, again, net estate, if the net estate is 200,000, that's tax exempt. So you have to derive or to, to get the net estate, not, not the gross estate. There's a different um, idea there. We'll discuss it later. But take note of Section 85 because non-resident citizen or non-resident, not a citizen, only proper properties situated in the Philippines shall be subject to tax. And you take note of this jurisprudence because in this case, the Supreme Court distinguished the donation inter vivos from donation mortis causa. Okay? So, donations mortis causa are well, you can include that. It, it is included in the computation of gross estate. You collate all the properties and everything. This one, donation mortis causa, because one of the essential distinction is mortis causa being in a form of a will are not required to be accepted by the donee during the donor's lifetime. So if it can be proved that the donation was inter vivos, then, well, that's a different matter on the succession, but for, for purposes of estate taxes, then it is not included. Only donation mortgage causa are included in the computation of gross estate. Okay, and you have this deduction because you collate all the properties, real, real properties, personal properties, all of the properties of the disease. And you have these deductions under Section 86 to arrive at the net estate. We have these actual funeral expenses, 5% of the gross estate, but not to exceed 200,000. Okay. And this one, you take note of this class. The date of death valuation rule. The idea here, if there is this claim against the estate, Okay, and say there's a claim against the state for 500,000. So you can deduct that from the gross estate to arrive at the net estate. But if later on, subsequently, you, you manage to have a commutation or a condonation of so much from the 500,000, still the 500,000 would be deducted, not the actual. Uh, value of the money you paid to the creditors. So this one, uh, the Supreme Court said, the U.S. Court ruled that the appropriate deduction is the value that the claim had at the date of the dissident's death. Where a lien claim against the state was certain and enforceable on the date of the dissident's death, the fact that the claimant subsequently settled for less lesser amount did not preclude the estate from deducting the entire amount of the claim for estate tax purposes. These pronouncements essentially confirm the general principle that post-debt developments are not material in determining the amount of the deduction. That is the date of death evaluation rule. Okay. The Supreme Court went on to say that there is no law nor do we discern any legislative intent in our tax laws which disregards the date of that valuation principle and particularly provides that post-debt developments must be considered in determining the, the net value of the state. It bears emphasis that tax burdens are not to be imposed nor presumed to be imposed beyond what the statute expressly and clearly imports. And you remember the basic principle, any doubt on whether a person, article, or activity is taxable is generally resolved against taxation. This is the rule, okay? If there is doubt. Second, such construction finds relevance and consistency in our rules on special proceedings wherein 
The term claims required to be presented against a dissident's estate is generally construed to mean that or demands of a pecuniary nature which could have been enforced against the deceased in his lifetime or liability contracted by the deceased before his death. Therefore, claims against the time of death are significant too and should be made the basis of the determination of allowable deduction. That's D zone versus CA, the date of death valuation rule. Okay, you just remember this. And you also have these judicial expenses. You just remember that those expenses that are only essential to the proper settlement of the state are allowed. So if you have this case, if you have incurred expenses for, if you're the heir, one of the heirs, and you hired a lawyer, it's not an allowable deduction if you paid the lawyer so much. Even the bond here for the qualification of the administrate, administrator, it is not allowed. In this case, the court disallowed the premiums paid on the bond filed by the administrator as an expense of administration since the giving of a bond is in the nature of a qualification for the office and not necessary in the settlement of the estate. Neither may attorney's fees incident to litigation incurred by the heirs in ascertaining their respective rights be claimed as a deduction from the gross estate. So this from section 86 class, those are the provisions which you, you know you are allowed to claim deductions from the gross estate to arrive at the net estate. And if after deducting so much, you're left with 200,000 or less, then you're exempted from paying judicial uh, state tax. And you have this property previously taxed. This is what they call sometimes as the vanishing deduction. This means that the value of the property of a taxpayer dissident, which he acquired by gratuitous title from a person who died within five years prior to the death of the taxpayer dissident, shall be allowed a certain percentage of deduction from gross estate based on the years that the taxpayer dissident held the said property. The idea here, class, is that because it is already previously taxed, so this subparagraph 2 under section 86A, property previously taxed, this one. The, and the idea here is if the taxpayer held the property, the dissident, the one who died, and he held the property from the tax from another one from uh, who maybe he donated it the first dissident or he succeeded from the person from the first dissident and if the, the 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 dissident died within one year prior to the death of the dissident you are allowed to claim 100% of the value as deduction from gross estate the idea there because is because of the proximity of the time of the death of the two taxpayers. So it was presumably tax, previously tax. So the, the longer you held the property, the, the lesser the amount or the value you are allowed to deduct. Okay, that's the idea. Property previously tax as known as vanishing deduction because the deduction vanishes over time. So that's the idea there. You also have, you can claim family home for one million, not to exceed. There must be a certification from the barangay chairman already. This is, okay, chairman to that effect. You know what I mean. And standard deduction. There's no need of substantiation here you are allowed to claim the amount 1 million, the standard deduction. And you have these medical expenses, not exceed 500,000, and should be incurred within one year. So if the medical expenses reach 1 million, you may claim or you may include that as claims against the state. Okay? So those are 
provisions under Section 86 which you should understand and remember. I just read the other provisions. And for Section 89, you have this notice of death. You must give notice, which a simple letter will do, even though exempt from estate tax where the value of the gross estate exceeds 20000 That's within two months after the death of the dissident or after being appointed as executor or administrator of the estate. There has got to be a notice of death. There's, there's, there's no form here. A, they don't follow any. We just a simple letter. You address that to the revenue district officer. And you, there is this section 90 for estate tax return. This is different because after you, you, what do you call this? You file your notice of death, then Within six months from the death of the dissident, you have to file your estate tax return. And you must file the return even though exempt from tax, remember 200000 below, if the value of the gross estate exceeds 200000 okay? Or, regardless of the value where the estate consists of registered or registrable property, which one real estate, motor vehicle, etc. You have to file your return. So the question might be asked: Are you if the gross estate is less than ten thousand? So you don't need to file a notice. But if it is for say for example fifty thousand, there is a money in the bank. You have to file a notice of death. But you don't have to file your estate tax return. So you get the idea there. But say for example you have this 100,000 worth lot in General Santos City. The, the requisite or the requirements are you have to file your notice of death within two months from the date of the dissident's death. And you also have to file your estate tax return within six months from, from death because why? Even though it does not exceed 200,000 gross estate, the value or the estate consists of the real estate. So you must file your estate tax return even though it is exempt from taxation or from state tax. And it may be extended but not to exceed 30 days. You have to file you have to inform the BIR about that if you want your state tax return to be uh, the, the, the deadline to be extended. It should not exceed 30 days. And then you pay your tax. Okay. At the time of the filing of return, you must pay your tax because the BIR won't accept if you're exempted. If you just file this and uh, there, there is no, you know, there's no tax due or tax payable. But it may be extended. Okay, you remember this under Section 91. Five years if the state is settled through the courts. So, nag-away-away na. If it is settled within, or years if settled extrajudicially, kung nagkasinabot. And may be required to put, it, to put up a bond not exceeding double the amount of the tax. And liability pertains to the distributive share of the heirs on the net estate. Okay? For the estate tax, the distributive share. So the heirs will have to contribute for in proportion to their what they will succeed or what they will inherit. The section 91 also, executor or administrator may mean any person who is in actual or constructive possession of any property of the dissident. The executor and the administrator, well, these two persons are, it may be one and the same, but the executor pertains really to, you execute the will. He is the one who is tasked to, you know, present the will to the court and be probated. The administrator is more on if there is a judicial partition of property or state and there is, there is no will, okay? But the executor and administrator can be one and the same person. But the administrator is more on 
uh, yeah, you administer the estate while it is winding up. So whether to normally the court appoints that administrator in a judicial partition, especially in interstate proceedings and well in the pro probate court. So there's this executor. And you take note of section 92, discharge of executor or administrator from personal liability. You remember, executor is personally liable for deficiency tax unless he applies for the discharge. There is this provision under section 92. And payment of tax before delivery by executor administrator. You remember this, the judge is not allowed for the court or the judge to distribute the shares of the estate or the heirs until there is a certification from the BIR that the estate tax is paid. Okay. Remember the car certificate authorizing registration. And you have the section 97, payment of tax antecedent to the transfer of shares, bonds, or rights. Take note of the last paragraph. This one. Banks are not permitted to allow withdrawal of deposits without the certificate from the BIR. Single or joint accounts. The BIR may allow upon prior authorization such withdrawal shall not exceed ang kape, 20,000. Gamay na class. This should be amended. Uh, remember I told you the government have has plans to, to amend this. The provisions. I think it's pending right now so we just have to wait. But just remember this. Date of debt valuation rule. Okay, and transfer in contemplation of debt. I think there was a question asked before about the exclusion on deduction of gross estate mortgage, this one. Uh, section 86, this one. You're allowed to deduct unpaid mortgages. Okay, it was asked before. Uh, there was this mortgage, the land, etc. So the value of the loan, because the property Actually, property secures the loan. Then, up to the value of the, the the loan that was that is secured by the mortgage, okay. and what uh, actual funeral expenses and judicial expenses? You remember this? And this one, this was not this was asked before several times. Uh, but I haven't encountered any question about this. You might be asked to define this or you might be asked to you know, discuss about this. What is this all about? Just remember this is a an allowable deduction but it vanishes over time for the period that you held the property. 100% one, you just read the provision. That's the idea of it. Family home certification from the barangay chairman. Standard deduction, 1 million. No need to substantiate. Okay. Medi medical expenses not to exceed 500,000, but not to, but within one year prior to the death. In excess of that, it may be included in the claims against the state. Okay, and you remember this. These two uh, notice is different from a state tax return. Just master this rule here. And the payment. For donor stocks, that's section 98 to 104. So you remember this. Exempt from the calendar year. So if you net gift net gift of 100,000 or less exempt for each calendar year. If the gift is given to a stranger, it's 30%. And remember this, if gifts given, if gifts are given to political candidates or parties, it is not taxable, okay? If candidate files a return of contribution with COMELEC. That's Section 13, RA 7166. But you must remember an elementary principle that PORO is not uh, a local, part of local government unit. The smallest unit is barangay. So if you donated anything to the pro chairman, 
it's not even be sanctioned by the Comilec, but it's a practice, right? So, pang one day shakar lang, the examiner might say, okay, there's this purok, um, what do you call the selection in where? Somewhere in the subdivision in Davao or in Cebu. I know there's Purok in, I think there, there are still Purok in, in the zone, but here you you notice that there is this Purok election. It should not be sanctioned because it is not one of the local government unit, the, the smallest one is Barangay. So a question is asked, I, a person donated 1 million to Purok chairman or to the candidate of to the candidate candidate X for Puruk chairman, etc. etc. That's thirty percent donor tax. You also have allowable deduction, encumbrance attached to the property, and you know this already, donation property nuptias. Given by parents to the extent of the first ten thousand. And those mentioned in special laws. Okay. The filing of return and payment of tax shall be done within thirty days after the gift was given and you take note of the definition section 104 okay so that's about it for I'll, I'll, okay i'll just look for new jurisprudence on this and we'll discuss that when i get there uh, in the second week of november so we'll discuss more extensively next about value added tax favorite of the examiners